when I get out of prison this time, I'm not coming back. I'm staying out. Because this, I know I'm tired of being treated like a dog. Even though I'm a human being, I'm tired of being treated like a dog. But I got to accept it. Because of where I'm at. At Ohio State Penitentiary, 465 violent men are locked in their cells alone 23 hours a day. How many of you guys have children? I know before, raise your hands. In the San Francisco County Jail, 62 violent men are housed together in an open dormitory. Here they give you step by step what your violence is, what it done to you. They help you see how you have been violent. I admit that I'm a violent man and willing to stop my violence. I'm willing to help others stop their violence. Violent men alone in cells. Other violent men living in a dormitory. Two radically different ways our society deals with men There's behind no bars. Circles. Turn around, face the wall, put your knees up there, put your head on the wall. We are a society with an army of two million men in prison. California alone locks up more people than France, England, Germany, and Japan combined. 95% of these prisoners end up back on the streets. There, almost half of them commit other crimes and are sent back to prison. Questions arise. Are the overflowing prison systems in the United States correcting violent behavior and deterring crime, or are they contributing to it? In this program, we will examine two diametrically different ways of dealing with violent men. One is to lock them away in solitary confinement in supermax prisons. It's stressful, very much so. Especially when a man is locked up 23 hours a day with no other human interaction other than the sound that you hear. You know, uh, chain and shackle everywhere you go. In San Francisco, the focus is on group therapy. That there is a belief system that is a male role belief system. 12 hours a day, inmates are immersed in self-awareness programs to help them confront their violent past and change their behavior. Your mother, your sister, your brother, your children, what are they feeling? Look at my, my, the murderer of my child. She died in prison. Which system, dormitory or solitary, better serves the country? You be the judge. Building supermaxes is a booming industry. More than 30 states operate one or more supermax units or prisons. Ohio State Penitentiary opened in Youngstown in 1998. The expectation is that we will house the most dangerous, disruptive, manipulative inmates in the Ohio system. We currently have about 47,000 inmates and we're trying to find absolutely uh, the most dangerous inmates among that 47,000 to house here so that our other institutions will be safer for the inmates and the staff that work there. Uh, we're the jail for the prison system. The philosophy of Supermax is maximum control. This is the control center for C block, which is one of four housing units here at the Ohio State Penitentiary. All the doors are open with the pod computers that are manned by two officers. Anytime an inmate goes to recreation, goes to a shower, on a visit, any of the such things, it's all controlled from here. You can let the porter out in C4, exercise B. The, the chief attribute of the construction that we have here is that it makes it much easier for us to protect staff from these inmates to protect other inmates from these inmates and to really protect the inmates from themselves. 
when an inmate comes into this institution, to some extent he's a little bit intimidated and, and unsure about what to expect in processing and the way we go about doing that when the inmates are brought in I think is real, real effective at setting the tone to begin with. Officer's going to take your leg irons off, all right? What you do when I take this cuff off, pull this hand in and put it on top of your head. Alright. Okay, underneath your tongue. Okay, behind the ears. Let me see behind each ear. The other one. Take your fingers and run it through your hair. Okay, let me see your fingers, both sides. Okay, up underneath your arms. Okay. I need you to lift up your penis. Okay, turn around. See the bottom of your feet, wiggle your toes for me. Other one. Okay, I need you to squat and cough. <coughs> All right. During admission, an inmate is strip searched twice, handcuffed and ankle cuffed twice. Inmates that we receive now tend to be much younger and much more violent than they were in the past. Face glass. And as we get these young, aggressive inmates in, we sometimes need to go to extraordinary measures to control their behaviors so that we can keep staff and other inmates safe. Drake, turn your head all the way to the left. Take that foot down, put your right leg up, put your pants back up. Shuffle your feet. No family phone calls or visits for the first month. Thereafter, if he behaves according to the rules of the prison, he will be permitted a TV. Two family visits a month, weekdays only, and one family phone call a week. Officers will check on him every half hour. Food is delivered through a security flap in the steel door. Five days a week, he may be allowed to come out of his cell for exercise and a shower. Is supermax confinement the best way to control violent men? A number of prison and jail systems are experimenting with alternatives to Supermax. In San Francisco, more than 60 men are held in an experimental program called RSVP, an acronym for Resolve to Stop the Violence Project. Family visits are allowed twice a week. Inmates can make phone calls every day. Inmates participate all day long in a kind of talking cure to violence. Middle class Joe. The picture that you have of yourself, right, kind of is an automatic pilot that guides you around in the world. So that what you're attracted to is basically what you think about yourself. In this jail, there are many men who have been in supermax prisons or in the solitary confinement units of maximum security prisons who are totally nonviolent in this open environment new inmates coming through the front door for the first time they're ready to fight with everybody to prove their masculinity and to gain respect and so on and you will see the inmates who've been here for a while socialize the new inmates and teach them you don't behave that way here you don't have to cool it and they do when i first got here i was kind of apprehensive to open myself up to a bunch of to a bunch of men to a bunch of hardcore men and i'm like wait a minute wait a minute you know the shield's going up i'm putting a wall up and um and i didn't want and i, I said i gotta i gotta get out of here i gotta how to you know there's too much going on. People, men are crying to each other. They're hugging each other. I'm like, whoa, this is a little too, whoa, too much for me. This ain't how I've ever done time. But, but you know, I just, 
I opened up a little bit, you know, just sharing what I knew. And um, and then I seen it, I seen it working. And I'm like, wait a minute here, wait a minute, something's happening here, you know. And and then I seen how this how this program really works and how it teaches us to stop the violence and that the most important thing is stop the violence. First they bring my emotions and stuff to the surface and then I go to groups like process groups and the facilitators teach me to take a look at what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling these things like compassion and empathy. The penitentiary ain't never showed me none of that. Putting you in a hole by yourself? That's isolating the problem. Gives the problem a chance to fester. The disease gets infected and gets toxic. Then when you get put, let, let go and you go back out to the society, what you got to work with? Nothing. No self-worth, no principles, no values, nothing but the things you have learned while you was locked up. That's it. Here is totally different. Here I got a sense of self-esteem, self-worth. I know I'm somebody. I know I'm a loving and caring people, person. One of the originators of the program, Sonny Schwartz, is an attorney working for the San Francisco Sheriff's Department. We brought together a very diverse group of um, citizens, law enforcement agencies. Um, we had ex-offenders, we had housewives, we had clergy, rabbis, ministers, uh, deputy sheriffs coming together for 18 months to design a program basically to, uh, again, focusing on how to stop domestic and random violence. Before that, though, we obviously needed the sheriff's endorsement and leadership on this. But when they came to me and said that they wanted to take uh, uh, not just drug, drug offenders and drug dealers, but they wanted to take violent offenders and put them all in one dormitory with no jail cells, um, <clears throat> that seemed a little bit uh, frightening, frankly. Um, you know, every jail administrator and prison administrator's uh, um, nightmare is a prison riot uh, or gang violence and uh, so we did build in an evaluation component and um, Dr. James Gilligan has been doing the evaluation. So far the results have been dramatic. Um, we found for example that uh, in the uh, 60 man dormitory that uh, in which the RSVP program is uh, taking place uh, during the year before the program started uh, there were something like 38 violent incidents uh, in the 60-man dorm. And now once the RSVP program was started within its 60-man dorm, during the first month there was one violent incident. During the next 12 months there were zero. Being here, um, having people like uh, Patty, she's a teacher, uh, every time she approaches me, I'm a human being. Having the counselors, every time they approach me, I'm a human being. I'm so used to being in the penitentiary where they break your collarbone. What life is like inside of the Youngstown Supermax prison depends on which side of the steel door you're on, officer or inmate. The antagonism begins as an officer makes the rounds. An inmate tries to intimidate her. And she doesn't give him the satisfaction of noticing. I think if, if it was more for a guy to do, you know, it wouldn't be so. They would have less guys beating on the door, hollering, and, you know, cussing, cussing people out and things like that, you know? You got guys back there hollering and, you know, screaming at each other, arguing. You got guys that here really frustrated. I mean, really frustrated. And most of them is ticking time bombs, you know? This is a real stressful situation. The daily, uh, I've been here approximately 15, 16 months. Uh, days are uneventful. Uh, one day flows into the next. Pretty, pretty much uniformity. Uh, they don't, there, there's no, there's no real human inter interaction. It's really, it's, it's really hard. If you don't have no, stu no uh, steady outside communications, this place really begins to bear on you. Generally, there are many stress programs that we run throughout uh, this institution. Mental health runs a stress program. Unit staff offers stress programs. 
Educational programs are offered also. There are three teachers for the 465 prisoners. I'm the teacher here at OSP. Um, I teach all levels, uh, 1 through 12, and we do that through a multitude of resources, including the video. Um, this week we're going to um, finish up the fractions. We're going to do the multiplication and division. So the tape was already on this morning. Did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah, it's been on all morning. Yeah. Okay, good. But you did real good on that quiz. Uh, if you have any problems, you know, put a big question mark on your page. Got it? You did real good on it. They have like a, a year waiting list for some of the programs here. And, you know, I've been waiting now for two programs I've been waiting for almost my whole time here, you know, because I signed up with my friend here and I'm still waiting. They tell you, you do this, you do that, we can get you out of here. You do what they tell you to do. It's not recognized. Like I said, I've been in every program the prison system's got to offer. 15, 20 different programs. I've got certificates and stuff in there, a big stack of them. But they're just useless paper. When you get frustration, you, you, you try to try not to take it out on the staff, but sometimes it comes out. And when it does, then you get punished for it. When conflicts arise between inmates and officers, either side can file a complaint. The complaints are heard by a panel of prison staff. We have a lot of disobedience of direct orders. We have some assaults. Spitting is considered an assault. Headbutting is considered an assault. Even though they're being escorted with the handcuff behind their back, they still have means of attacking. M.A. Bolton, you, you were written up for disobedience of a direct order, which shall include aggravated insubordination. How do you plead on these charges? I'm pleading not guilty. You plead not guilty? Yes. What did Mr. Cassidy say to you when he came to your door? I don't know what he said. Like I said, I was asleep. He didn't, say, you, you didn't hear him say urine, you know, I need a urine sample from you or anything no, like that? No, sir. Like I said, I'm in my right state of mind anyway. You know, when you sleep, you just waking up in your right state of mind. So I couldn't say anything to the guy. He didn't come back? Mm-hmm. -mm. I wouldn't have no problem no giving no joint. I wouldn't have no problem at all doing it for him. I, like I said, I was asleep. Mr. Cassidy, you wrote uh, M.A. Bolton up for uh, a Class 2 Rule 1 disobedience of a direct order. Was the M.A. coherent? Did he know you were there? Um, that morning, we were doing the, the uh, random, random testing within, the, within that uh, pod. Um, the M.A. Bolton refused at that time. When an inmate refuses, uh, we don't return to the cell. It's only if he claims at that time that he is unable to go. So in your, in your professional opinion, he was awake and did know that you wanted a urine test from him, correct? Yes. Any further questions, M.A. Bolton? No, This is a continuation of RIB case number 50017. It may vote in this panel has voted independently for a decision to be made. It was a majority vote. We found you guilty, and the panel is recommending to the warden that the place you on level one status for 30 days due to the fact you did uh, refuse to submit to a urine test. Level one means no visits from relatives or friends, no family phone calls, no TV. During his years in prison, before he entered the San Francisco RSVP program, Emmanuel Sanders was locked down in solitary three times. And the thing about violence is this. It impacts people so deeply that it never goes away. Once you are affected by violence, it will always traumatize you. Unless you do some work, you get some help. They have a class, um, a group here called Victim Impact, where victims from the outside who have actually been through a traumatizing experience and victims of offenders come in and share their experience with us. My name is Jean. 
and I'm the survivor of murder victims. I would like to introduce you to my daughter and my little grandson. My daughter's name is Nancy. Yes, I said my daughter's name is Nancy because it will always be that. My little grandson, his name is Jesse. And I'm going to tell you what happened to my Nancy and to my Jesse. Jack and I had planned to go to Nancy's because Nancy had a boyfriend. The boyfriend's name is Paul. Jack inserted his key in the lock, pushed the door open, and as he did, we could see two people lying on the living room floor, two adults. Jack stepped right over the first person. The second person was Nancy. Meanwhile, Jack literally ran to the bedroom to see if he could find our little Jesse. Jesse was just 23 months old, stood about this tall, and had just learned to say his name, Essie, had just learned to jump. That's as high as he could get. We learned about the perpetrator, a young man by the name of Richard. Nancy ultimately was stabbed 70 times. Richard threw Jesse on the floor and proceeded to stab him 56 times, breaking the knife off in the floor beneath his body. He then picked him back up and threw him across the room back into his crib. Richard stayed in the apartment the rest of that night. He rifled through all of Nancy's possessions. He did call a friend and have the friend pick him up with the tool chest that he took. And I want to say to you that Richard took more than just three lives that night. Richard took my life, took my husband's life, and I can tell you that today my husband is in the hospital because of it. I come here and I talk to you and this is saving my life. Jack buries his. So I will say to each of you as men, whatever you have that you're burying, get it out, get it talking about it. Well, I'm a person who's committed crimes and never fully understood the severity or or the full impact on the victims uh, that have committed crimes and uh, and to stories like yours and do what I'm doing for myself today, I'm taking a look at that. So hopefully one day when I get out of, of whatever time that I got to go do and I get on with my life and uh, get into a recovery program that I'm able to repay, pay them back, if, even if it's just to say I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Eight years ago, my baby brother was like, a victim to a violent crime was killed by a drive-by, you know, so I sympathize with, empathize with you, you know, and each and every person in here. And, you know, because it's hard when you lose somebody to a violent crime, you know, but it's, it's like, it's even harder to, to, to think now the things that I've done in life, you know, when I get re it, all of this gives me reality check and it hurts, you know. My mom got murdered. I want to, I want to, I want to learn how I can talk about it. All right, so I need you to tell me. Cause I, I need, when I go home, I want to learn how to talk about it, if I can talk to my sister about it. We won't have to cry no more. By you coming in and sharing your story with us, it also helps us to overcome our own violence as victims and offenders. And that's so contrary to the normal uh, prison techniques that you know we're so used to. It's really beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. I always feel that if, however many of you, if one of you hears my story, 
and you walk away from here and you decide that you're never going to harm another human being, that's one other family, one more mom, one more dad that's never going to walk in these shoes because they're so uncomfortable. We could take a few moments and just sit in silence and think about what type of impact you have had on your victims' lives. What I hear these men describing is uh, that they've gained the capacity to look at the pain and the loss that they've both suffered and inflicted on others. And uh, to deal with it by talking it out, by handling it appropriately, by grieving where grief is necessary, uh, rather than by acting out uh, in violent ways as a way of running away from the pain. About five years ago, I got the biggest part of this. At Ohio's Supermax, inmate Anthony Liberatore doesn't get many chances to show off his body art. Eighteen years in prison and I've run across quite a few really good tattoo artists. And these are the result. This here, it's just a skull with, with some funny colored eyes. He's missing one eye. I've got a, a girl with butterfly wings. Until now, my mom didn't know I had all these tattoos. Now when she watches this Discovery special, she'll be uh, surprised. One hour a day, Liberatore has the right to leave his cell for exercise and a shower. I like to come out here three times a week. Going through all the hassle, getting shaken down and all that stuff. Kind of keeps me from coming out six days a week. Glass has been removed from the windows of one of the exercise cells, which allows authorities to maintain that inmates have access to outside recreation. The biggest part for me is just breathing fresh air. This sucks, <laughs> to put it simply. Uh, I, I think that maybe Maybe there, there's a reason for an institution like this, but I think that uh, for the most part, this place is abused. I mean, it, it's all about money, this, this system that I'm a part of. Uh, I, I don't believe that they're going to leave an empty bed in an institution like this where they've spent millions and millions of dollars to build it. People get sent here who don't deserve to be here. I believe I'm one of them. I'm not telling you I'm an angel because I'm not. In 18 years, I've done plenty. But I haven't done anything that merits being sent here. I'm on a committee that has the ability to, at any time, go into any prison in the state of Ohio and look to see how they're run, how the prisoners are being treated, how the employees are being treated, how people are being treated from the inside and the outside. It bothered me when I visited that Supermax prison to find that many of those prisoners did not belong there. I found that in my study, that of the 450 prisoners that were in there, that uh, in fact only 200 of them should be considered maximum security, uh, should be considered people that would spend their time 23 hours out of the 24 in a lockdown situation. I just received another year without any real explanation. I got another year to do here. I was just given uh, a couple weeks ago and here a man has to do really the best he can if it comes to a point where mentally he has a breakdown, he's basically on his own. Inmate McWilliams expressed a concern to talk with our mental health staff earlier and we're um, going to allow him to talk with the mental health staff.
Ohio's in other prisons and there ain't no truth to that at all. And when I said something and uh, Brian and them told me, yeah, we're going to fix you, we're going to put something in your food. And la like last night and the night before last, I ate supper, I got real sick. And I've been asking to see the psych ever since Wednesday last week. I mean, we get treated like dogs here, man. And when you say something, we get treated more like Excuse my language, but that's how it is. We currently have over 460 inmates here. Of that number, all but 12 are doing very well. Those 12 take up an awful lot of our time and energy and we continue to try to reach those 12 as we have the vast majority of inmates. Yeah, you know, I, I got a history of being in psych units, even on the streets. I've been in and out of the mental hospitals ever since the age of uh, six, seven years old. And from, my, from what I was told, if you got a history of psych problems, you ain't supposed to be here. Legally, no seriously mentally ill inmates should be imprisoned at the Ohio Supermax. As part of a settlement of a class action lawsuit, Ohio agreed that seriously mentally ill prisoners must be held in other institutions. Dr. Stuart Grassian is a forensic psychiatrist on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School. I've been studying the uh, effects of solitary confinement on prisoners for uh, about the last 20 years. Uh, during the course of that I've probably interviewed uh, well over a hundred inmates and evaluated the mental health records of several hundred people like we just saw on the tape. Uh, an individual with a history of illiteracy, probably mild mental retardation, uh, some evidence of uh, central nervous system dysfunction in the past, hyperactivity, attention deficit disorder, uh, a history of being diagnosed with major mood disorders, and uh, in his case as well with a psychotic disorder. Well, put them in a condition, a situation of stringent confinement, and uh, it's just common sense what's going to happen to them. They're not going to be able to tolerate those kind of conditions, and their behavior is just going to deteriorate. One of the chief criticisms nationally of Supermax prisons is the suggestion that inmates who spend their time here or are socially isolated or suffer from sensory deprivation. In fact, the reality is, at least at the Ohio State Penitentiary, these inmates live in small communities of 16 individuals. There is a tremendous amount of communication back and forth with the inmates. They even uh, play chess from cell to cell. We got a king on 12, a bishop on 20, a knight on 19, and a queen on 34. In some supermax facilities, there are some very limited opportunities for communication. Often those opportunities involve shouting at each other. Now, I, I know I've been in those cells, uh, I've talked to inmates who've been in those cells. After a while, shouting back and forth becomes so odious, so unpleasant, that after a while you start giving up. One of the inmates uh, I saw in the video, I noticed had some burns or cut in the back of his neck, apparently self-inflicted kind of hard to commit suicide in a setting like that. You have to be pretty desperate to do it. Uh, and often the ways that people go about it are pretty desperate and sometimes pretty grotesque. Well, if you look at inmates who are that desperate to get out of those cells, that they're willing to hurt themselves in the kind of awful way, I mean, cutting off their genitals, all kinds of awful things, people eating parts of their own bodies, seen that? We make our rounds every half an hour. We're looking for living, breathing flesh. Um, we count to make sure that all the inmates are doing fine, and make sure that we still have them all. The fact that this type of incarceration causes severe psychiatric disturbances and overt psychotic states 
has been well known for a long time. I've seen individuals who've made multiple, multiple attempts at suicide, awful attempts, and finally succeeded. And in reviewing those situations, I've seen departments of correction say the person was not mentally ill and he was only manipulating and tragically he went too far. Many complaints Human rights attorneys Stoughton and Alice Lind are documenting the effects of prolonged solitary confinement. They correspond with more than 200 Youngstown inmates. It was just a few months after we retired that the Ohio State Penitentiary opened and within the first week that it was opened we rest started receiving letters. Recently I did have a, the experience of a family member calling me and, ex and reading to me something that made her feel that it was likely that a member of her family would commit suicide there. And I was going to ask the chaplain to visit him and uh, got a call very, very early that morning saying that he was dead. After three months in solitary, Richard Pitts, convicted of selling drugs, committed suicide. In the Youngstown prison, we have found that we can't really tell what type of system that they have in place for mental health uh, and treating mental health problems. And that's rather frustrating, not only for those of us in the legislature, but for the families who have come to us and told us over and over again that their family member um, that um, are living in the conditions of 23 hours in lockdown are suffering from some form of mental health problems. That's a problem not only for myself, the family, but for all of us in America. But I will tell you this much. In Youngstown, we've had a disproportionate amount of attempts on, uh, on their own lives. We've had a disproportionate amount of, of uh, suicides. We've had uh, people that are suffering severely. Seventy inmates were placed on suicide watch in the first two years of operation at Youngstown. Three succeeded in killing themselves. How does a prison setting live with those kinds of behaviors and not recognize that people are seriously mentally ill. You can be sitting in the back of your cell, hallucinating, delusional, incoherent, unable to talk, not eating, but as long as you're not making a fuss here and now, then according to the definitions in these departments of correction, you're not mentally ill. Is it really reasonable for the public to expect that corrections can solve all the problems that inmates come to us with. Are we really rehabilitating inmates or are we habilitating them? Can we take someone who has suffered physical and or sexual abuse as a child, uh, failed in public education because of learning disabilities, uh, can we take these people who come to us with so many scars and, and turn them around? I think it's really quite remarkable that we are able to keep more than one in three of them from coming back. If you think about it, 95% of these inmates leave prison and come back to our communities. Have we made our communities safer by treating individuals like this, by letting them feel, having them feel that they've been treated like dogs? Michael Flynn, an inmate in San Francisco's RSVP program, recalls his experiences in solitary. So being in the hole intensified my depression. It just, just made me hate myself even more. I mean, I hated myself for getting myself in this situation to being put in prison. But then, you know, here, here I am cutting myself up. And even as an adult, I did that. I cut myself up because I didn't, you know, I was just a kid in a man's body, never getting attention all my life. So then I la you know, I'm screaming, I want attention, I want attention. No, they put you in a place where it's cold, they take away everything, especially if they think you're a suicide risk. They take away sheets, they take away clothes. I, I remember being in there and all I had was just some bodysuit of pads. 
So if I bounced off the walls or something, I wouldn't hurt myself. And all I did was lay on the floor and cry and cry and cry and, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. And, you know, and I would think, how do I get out of this? How do I get out? How can I kill myself? I want to escape this pain. And when I came out, I, I didn't know how to deal with people. It's like, well, put me back in there. There was one time when I got arrested, I put myself, I said, put me in, put me in the hole. Because that's what I know. That's what's safest. At least I know my boundaries and no one can come in there. A poster on the wall at the San Francisco jail asks, is this what it takes to be a man? Violence is learned. It can be unlearned. Inmates meet to examine the roots of violence in the culture they grew up in. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Man Alive class. Man Alive is uh, an acronym for men allied nationally against living in uh, violent environments. And we're here today to work on a violent incident with a man basically to deconstruct the male role belief system to see how uh, his violence started, how it happened, and how it stopped. Um, Jeff is going to uh, is going to talk about what this uh, particular violent moment uh, led to. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, it was in, in 1999. Um, it was about a couple months after my mother died. I just got out of prison again. Uh, I was hooked. Um, my wife was taking care of me because I had just got through beating a three strikes case and she didn't want me going out getting into more trouble. Uh, she would got some insurance money. Um, <clears throat> I talked her into, into um, letting me take some of that insurance money and go up north and cop some dope. So I was getting ready to leave and she wanted me to stay home and it became an argument. Um, it was to the point where she had all the dope, she had all the money and she wasn't going to give it to me. And finally, I snapped. I said, give me the money um, now and quit playing with me. She said, no, I'm not giving you the dope. Why don't you just stay here? Why don't you stay here? So I said, you know what, you f***ing And I snatched her by her throat, and I put her on the bed. Um, and I told her, give me the dope. Give me the dope. Give me the dope. I got outside, got out of my car, and as I'm starting the car and backing out of the driveway, she's, she's chasing me, like beating on the car, and I just burned rubber and headed off into the city. And that's, uh, that's about it. Okay. Um, where did we get the first choice to violate, Jeff? Um, when she wouldn't give me the dope. When she wouldn't give you the dope, okay. And when she wouldn't give it to me, I felt she was kind of controlling me. Keep it <gasps> there it is. Yeah. Okay, so I went there it into, is. I went into shock. All right. Next question. John? What is the basic tenet of the male role belief system? The two roles. <sighs> Superior and inferior. Superior and inferior. Okay. Just to back up a second, what is the male role belief system? The male role belief system is a set of ideas or teachings that I grew up believing is my role that I need to play to be a male. So what about the male role belief system in this particular story? <clears throat> um, I felt at the time that she had me feeling inferior and, and I jumped out in my superior role. That's when I snatched her by her throat. Got it. And man, you want to... In your disclosure, Jeff, I heard you state um, that when you asked her for the dope, she didn't give it to you. And you said that you began to do something. What was that you began to do? Oh, is that right? Yeah, you began so, to antagonize, okay. right? Antagonize her, right? right? Calling her names. Right. I have a question for, for Jeff, too, is, is when you, um, when you call somebody a name, does it make it easier for you to do your violence? Uh, can you call somebody other than their name? Yeah. Do you know why? No. Don't know why. Manual. Well, for me, when I do my violence, and um, I take, instead of calling them by their name, I call them something other than their name, at that point, I stop them in my head. They're not no longer a person, so they're no longer equal. They're a thing now. Usually when I call names, it makes me feel superior. That's it. Right. That's, that's right. it. You got it. So this whole board is about making Jeff superior in this thing and making his partner inferior, right? Okay. Any questions about that? Any, any feedback for Jeff? I have a question, and that's, um, I was wondering if you could just tell me some of the uh, um, emotional losses that you and your partner experienced from this incident. Trust. Whew, major trust. Um, our relationship after that wasn't the same. Um, You know, um, 
when I looked upon this board and I seen submissive bitch. That's my wife. And uh it's really um and now I'm going through changes with her because the way that I left her out there, um and I don't know I don't know if I can get it back. Have you thought of any type of way to heal yourself or restore some of these emotional feelings that you destructed? I, I got to restore myself first before I can restore anybody else. And when I restore myself, then I can try to restore my family. My family might not want to be restored. And, and I know I, gotta make, I can make that effort. I can't force that. Um, and I got to try to restore my community. Um, and if I can't restore, uh, what I got to do is make the effort. That's what Man Alive is teaching me. I got to make the effort. And this is just a tiny step on a long journey for me. It was really hard for me because of my violence. I did a lot of violence, you know, just like all the rest of our, my fellow brothers here. Started in the early 70s. And now I have to take my time to undo my violence, to learn how to stop, and it's going to take a lifetime for me. So I commend you and I love you, brother. Can I get a hug? Yeah. Good job. Good job. <laughs> That's good, yeah. <laughs> the big questions remain. Will the inmates coming out of San Francisco really have learned to control their violence? Will Supermax inmates really have learned their lesson? If I get out of prison this time, I'm not coming back. I'm staying out. Supermaxes may be necessary for controlling some inmates, but at what price? To maintain security at this level is very, very expensive. The personnel costs alone are huge and within a three-year period will equal the total cost of construction. The only way that that can be justified is that it keeps the other 46,000 inmates in our department safer, uh, certainly keeps our staff around the department safer, and as long as we are able to run the Ohio State Penitentiary in a safe manner so that our employees are not at risk from these very dangerous inmates, uh, then uh, I think that we are meeting our mission. I've committed some violent acts, true enough. I paid my debt to society for those things, you know? Here they teach us awareness plus action equals change. Once you become aware of your violence and the information that it takes to stop violence, what the impact is, you need to do the actions, commit the actions that it's going to require for change. That's what this place is about, change. This is how you prevent violence. This is how you help communities heal. It's how you help the, the survivors of victims heal. And this is something I think the whole country, and for that matter, the whole world needs to learn from. I am learning from this program, and I hope that uh, I, I hope that everybody who's interested in this problem will, will learn from it. Solitary or therapy? It is never too late. Are supermaxes further damaging men already prone to violence? More studies are needed. But no one is studying the consequences of this kind of confinement. Will intervention programs like the one at San Francisco lessen the pressure to build more and more supermaxes? What direction will America choose? <laughs>